Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Darcy Belito de Luna, and I am the Continuing Education Manager at the AIUM. As part of the AIUM's advocacy for healthcare professionals, I am honored to host this webinar with renowned members of our community leadership, Dr. Oliver Kripkins, Dr. Brian Bromley, Dr. Arun Nagdev, and Dr. Richard Barr. Today's webinar will present guidelines for transducer and equipment cleaning, as well as personal protective equipment during this COVID-19 pandemic. Additionally, the experts will explain implementations within the specialty areas of radiology, OBGYN, and emergency medicine. If you have questions for the presenters during this webinar, you may type them into the question box on the right side of your screen. You will be able to submit questions throughout the webinar, but the presenters will not be answering questions during this broadcast. After the webinar, we will compile the submitted questions, answer them, and upload them to the AIUM website along with the recording of today's webinar. And now I'm pleased to begin this presentation with Dr. Oliver Kripkin. Thank you, Darcy, for the introduction. It's a pleasure to be on this webinar. My name is Oliver Gripfgans, and uh, I, would lead you, I will lead you through the introduction of this webinar. The objectives here are to understand the context of viral transmission, as well as cleaning of viral pathogens in our work life, uh, as well as information about subspecialty workflow to interrupt viral transmission and to protect the provider and the patient. Uh, in terms of nomenclature, keep in mind that the virus is called SARS-CoV-2 and the disease is called COVID-19. As I said, I'm Oliver Gifkans. I'm a physicist. I'm the chair of the Cleaning Guidelines Task Force at the AIUM, and I will be presenting uh, information from the literature. So the AIUM guidelines for cleaning and preparation are mostly concerned with cleaning of transducers and equipment. As you know from a previous documentation from the AIUM, the transducers are uh, categorized into external transducers, interventional transcutaneous or percutaneous uh, transducers, internal transducers, et cetera. The equipment is concerned with keyboards and handles on the ultrasound machines, but also with uh, gel bottles. For cleaning to be effective, it is uh, very important to uh, not only disseminate educational materials, but to also understand the materials and execute them, and then finally also document them. Guidelines come from a large range of inputs from societies, uh, agencies, private enterprise. I listed some of them here. This is not exhaustive, but you can appreciate that there is a lot of information out there. We're basing our information on the Center for Disease Control, the CDC, as well as the FDA and the literature. The guidelines that are coming from these various inputs are mostly concerned with these common categories that are listed on the left. These include setting up the room, reducing the number of transducers on your ultrasound scanner to the ones necessary, cleaning adequate sur surfaces, including the keyboard and handles, um, maybe changing the staffing, changing your scheduling, and adjusting your scan protocol. Some have suggested to take cine loops instead of still, still images in order to be able to choose a better still image later at uh, offline. In terms of literature, there is now already literature available for COVID-19. Uh, COMF 2020 uh, points out the human-to-human -human transmission. They are listing an incubation time that is close to that of the CDC. They are listing two to 10 days. CDC says two to 14 days. The main pathway is droplet infection. This can also go by means of contaminated surfaces and the virus can stay there for up to nine days. Interestingly, te uh, temperatures above 30 degrees Celsius or 86 degrees Fahrenheit actually shorten dead survival on these surfaces. Inactivation is actually pretty straightforward. Uh, it's done efficiently with low-level disinfection. Unfortunately, to date, there are no specific therapies, and so early containment of the spread is uh, really important. Kampf is also pointing out the self-administration, so to say. So touching your face 
is something that we very frequently do. Uh, Quark in 2015 is pointing out that we do this 23 times an hour. And we're touching mostly our mouth, our nose, our eyes. All of those are actually the pathways by which the virus can enter our body because then you don't have intact skin. Our skin is a very good protective layer. And so in a study earlier in the 80s and then in the 90s, uh, people were looking at how viruses are transmitted and even a five second touch can transfer 30% or more of the viral load. So while gloves are really important, the masks and the goggles actually provide an extra physical barrier so that even if we touch our face because of a reflex, because we're so used to it, it will prevent that the virus can enter. And of course, hand washing is what we need to do. And this was pointed out 10 years ago in the study by Yen, but it's as necessary today. And then we should stick to routines. Uh, sticking to routines uh, interrupts the transmission because in the routines, we have certain uh, workflows that are concerned with hygiene and with disinfection. And if we get out of this routine, this is when errors can happen and this is when the virus can spread. Surface stability was investigated by Van Dormaan in uh, 2020, just a recent study. And they were specifically looking at SARS-CoV-1 and 2. And while there is a lot of similarity between the two virus groups, it uh, can, see, can be seen here on the, on the top that SARS-CoV-2 on cardboard actually lives much longer. But nevertheless, we should be aware of the viability of this virus in aerosols, plastics, stainless steel, and so on, and that we really need to clean these surfaces. And ultrasound transducers and keyboards and the machines, they consist of plastics. And so a duration of 72 hours can easily spread the virus if we don't adequately clean. In order to put this whole uh, uh, discussion a little bit in context, I'd like to point out a study from 2013 by Siki. They looked at, um, at echocardiogram procedures in 2004, performed at the University Hospital in Os Osaka in Japan, uh, specifically in a surgical ICU. And they talked about, uh, about hospital-acquired infections and an outbreak. Um, for quite a while, they did not know where these infections were originating from, but thanks to documentation, they could actually trace it to a damaged transesophageal echo probe. And 15 centimeters from the end of the probe, there was a five millimeter diameter defect. And, and this defect is where cultures could grow. And even high level disinfection would not be able to remove these cultures because it wasn't mechanically cleaned to begin with. And they did not use a sheath. And so it's, um, it's really important to clean the ultrasound transducers, not by a just procedural high-level disinfection, but by really understanding of what the cleaning entails. And it does entail cleaning ultrasound out of these nooks and crevices that is here highlighted on this face, the ray probe on the side, where maybe uh, a needle guide or some other 3D guide uh, can be attached. And these nooks and crevices allow ultrasound gel to stay longer, even if you just wipe uh, superficially with a, with, a, with a towel that is disinfecting. If you don't get all the ultrasound gel out, then you can have transmission here. And then this robotic drop-in ultrasound transducer on the bottom, you can see very well that if you don't rinse this one under flowing water, it, it will be next to impossible to get all the, the gel out. One other topic of discussion here is ultrasound guided line placement. Uh, the AIUM recommends low level disinfection for these types of procedures. And in a study from 2010, uh, it was shown uh, that the difference between ultrasound guided and traditionally placed lines did not lead to more infections. In, the, in, their, in their study, they had two groups, uh, both with 402 patients. And in the ultrasound group where the line placement was done under ultrasound guidance, they had two infections. And in the traditionally placed, they had three infections. So there, there was no need for high level disinfection as long as the insertion point is away from the probe and you're only in touch with intact skin. Now, as mentioned earlier, training and execution of procedures is really important. And so Westerway uh, has uh, published in 2017, a survey in the United Kingdom where they had 188 responders and uh, most of them were actually sonographers followed by radiologists. And they were 
interrogating if people cleaned their machines uh, and how often and how many procedures they had. And so on the left here, you see the number of scans performed per day. And uh, they were ranging from five to more than 20, with the majority of them being uh, 15, six, uh, 15 to 20 or maybe more. Uh, what can be alarming is the cleaning frequency. Some of them didn't clean the machine ever. Luckily, um, most of them cleaned the keyboard 60% uh, uh, per day, 60% of them cleaned them once per day, um, and 44% cleaned the, the machine, the, the, the scan net and the cords uh, in 40% uh, after each patient. But you can still see that there is improvement possible. And in, in, in the situation of SARS-CoV-2, we should be diligent in cleaning our keyboards and transducers and cords after every patient and not uh, once a day or even more rarely. Uh, bacterial load is uh, well documented. Um, um, Sarati has shown in 2017 that ultrasound transducers, if not cleaned, are uh, especially attractive uh, for, for colonies to form. Uh, they um, investigated 36 ultrasound transducers and they found 53 colony forming units before training of the, uh, the, the, the users. And they found zero of them after training. They compared these colony forming units uh, with other uh, situations that we encounter in life. And they, they actually checked on bus poles and they checked on toilet seats, believe it or not. And so ultrasound probes before training had um, more than uh, 50 or 53 colony forming units on, on average here, or the median actually. And bus poles was less than 30 and toilet seats was less than five. So in, in, in other words, toilet seats were cleaner than ultrasound probes if they were not cleaned. And it makes sense because you have gel up on the ultrasound probe and it's, it's ideal for, for colonies to form. Now, luckily, after education and after these procedures and training actually were taking place, the colony forming units were reduced to zero and that's where we need to be. But it's again, it's about education and about execution. This chart here was introduced in the Arium Cleaning Guidelines as published of March 28, 2020. It summarizes graphically what we were saying already previously in text, and you should, you're highly encouraged to consult this chart uh, when you perform your procedures. It differentiates between external transducer procedure, procedures, interventional percutaneous procedures, and internal transducer procedures. Consult with the chart, adhere to the chart, discuss it with your colleagues, and reach out to the AIUM via Connect if you have questions or email me personally. Uh, at the end of my talk, I want to talk. Uh, I want to address the, the EPA guidelines as well as one uh, frequently asked questions. At EPA, in their list N of disinfectants, is pointing out specifically disinfectants against SARS-CoV-2. When you consult with this list. Uh, you should follow the disinfection directions that are uh, listed for these particular viruses. At first, this can be confusing because SARS-CoV-2 is actually not in this list. But if you want to use these cleaning agents and you want to be effective against SARS-CoV-2, follow the viruses that are listed in this column. And then last but not least, people are reaching out to us asking about cooling fans and ultrasound cards and if they can distribute viruses. So to date, there's no evidence for viral distribution in the reviewed ultrasound literature. People were asking if there is a possibility to install a HEPA filter or if, they, if these machines come with HEPA filters. To our knowledge, so far, they do not come with HEPA filters. And installing a filter can actually impact the airflow pattern and cause the ultrasound scanner to overheat. It will also allow the air to seek alternative paths. This defeats the filter, filtration process that is in place right now and it will potentially damage your scanner. Possible solutions, of course, include the use of portable systems such as tablets. I thank you for your attention for this segment, and I will now give the screen uh, to Dr. Nagdev. Thank you, Oliver. Um, hi, this is uh, Arun Nagdev. I'm the ultrasound director at Highland General Hospital in Oakland, California. Um, and I'm gonna speak uh, more in depth about the experience as a point of care user and some of the guidelines that 
numerous governing bodies, including IUM, have proposed in the era of COVID-19. So I, I just want to point out that the emergency department is a chaotic environment. It is great to have protocols in place that ask for very standard procedures. Commonly, these procedures don't happen. Um, I tried to build a reasonable protocol for my department based on guidelines that are out there in the literature and based on evidence and based on a pragmatic approach to care of patients. So I think that uh, the goal will be to at least allow the point of care user to have a possible pathway for uh, reduction in or actually improvement of disinfection of all sound probes. So I think that the initial outburst of literature that came out in regards to ultrasound and the ability for the point of care user to define uh, coronavirus or COVID-19 um, came out very quickly. And a lot of people were very excited about using this novel technology to define the disease. And I feel that this is a the, the beauty of our field of, of trying to help, of helping uh, patients and improving care. With that also comes a understanding of the possibility of the ultrasound machine acting as a fomite. So um, I think that pragmatic approach is really what I've taken to the concept of disinfection for ultrasound systems. So again, Oliver talked about this. This is the AIM guidelines. And I'm going to start off by talking about the external transducers um, that are commonly used. Uh, and what are the basic ideas of how to clean them in various environments? So we know that for semi-critical devices, such as TE probes that people are using and endocavitary probes that are not in contact with mucosa, high-level disinfection is still a standard procedure and we're still abiding by that technique. Um, for, not, for reusable non-critical devices, such as our curvilinear, linear, and phased array transducers that are coming in, coming in contact with intact skin, um, we really believe that basic low-level disinfection is still the way to go, and I'll explain that in a little more detail. Again, this is the list of EPA guidelines for products that could be used for low-level disinfection in the period of SARS-CoV-2. Uh, it's a long, multiple-page list with the most important thing for me is to recognize that what you have in your department, A, matches the active ingredients, and B, you recognize the dwell time or the contact time. Uh, this can range anywhere from 10 minutes to one minute. <clears throat> and clinicians, at least in the point-of-care environment, I commonly when one, two, three, or four minutes really doesn't make a difference because by the time you wipe off the probe, by the time you get to the next user, you're probably at that point anyway. So I'm not too worried about the one to two to three minute dwell time. This is an interesting article that Oliver already spoke about. I just want to point out the fact that because of the worry of contact contaminations, such as I'm leaning over a patient and my transducer cable contacts the patient or the bed or aerosolization, we've decided to separate these two categories to allow us to have a better way of performing disinfection. So I've kind of broken them into non-droplet precautions and droplet or aerosolized precautions. And this is a real concern in the emergency department because we have these two varied types of patients. So I'm gonna talk about the CARP-based system first. And we have used CARP-based systems for years in, in the point of care environment. And <clears throat> I've, we've recommended that before the CARP is used on patients, and we've done this for all of our carts in our department, is remove all the extraneous inform, uh, it, not, not information, but extraneous material, excuse me, such as IV lines, towels, that are commonly in the back of the cart. We also, like everybody else, expect proper hand hygiene and gloves for all examinations. The discussion between single-use gel packets versus standard gel bottles is still up in the air, and we are still using standard bottles when we are using our CARP-based systems. If the bottle is contaminated, they're meant to be, meant to be removed from that environment. Um, I took this picture to demonstrate the idea with one of my residents who's performing a, a, a fake scan on the patient. Again, this is a patient with non-droplet precautions. There's no active CPR. There's no intubation. The patient's not actively coughing. All of our patients are masked. Uh, I purposely put two colored gloves on him 
to indicate that one hand is considered a dirty hand and one hand is considered a clean hand, i.e. when he's touching the screen or making adjustments with the ultrasound system, that area is considered clean. After he is finished with this exam, and also we're using regular, uh, regular gel, when he is finished with this exam, <clears throat> he's cleaning the transducer and the cable and anything else that comes in contact with either the patient or if he uses his right hand or his dirty hand to touch the ultrasound system. That is our standard operating practice currently to reduce, again, the chance of fomite transmission. We're using simple common disinfectants that are found in most ERs um, and uh, point of care environments with the dwell time based on the EPA guidelines. And this is something you're gonna have to look up in your own department. You, there is also an ability to make your own disinfectant if it gets to a low level of disinfection, if this is an issue. This is uh, based on the EPA guidelines. Again, it's a nine to one um, sodium hypochlorite solution that can be used sprayed onto a towel and then you can wipe your system down. That can be in, in situations where certain departments are running out of these common low level disinfectants. Again, in the emergency department <clears throat> and other areas such as the ICU, the risk of aerosolization and droplet uh, formation is pretty high. <clears throat> Active cheap CPR intubations, positive pressure ventilation or negative pressure, uh, positive pressure ventilations or non-invasive ventilation, excuse me, nebulization, and patients actively coughing all put the machine or system at risk of getting contaminated. At this point, this is a huge issue and was something that we had to think about to try to avoid. <clears throat> For our CART-based systems, this is a real issue because we assume that if somebody's having chest compressions in a room or uh, having nebulized um, albuterol, the entire system is considered contaminated. And every time we stepped into these rooms, we'd have to pull out the system and clean the entire system, including the screen, the keyboards, every part of it, including the bottom of the system, which is a huge time sink in a busy environment. Some people have suggested to place covers on these system, but as you can see, even in this cover, this place that was uh, that uh, a physician placed online, uh, you can see that there's a lot of exposure to the ultrasound system to various areas that will need to be cleaned after you remove that cover. And again, I still think this is a huge time sink for most people. So I think handheld systems in this environment, especially specifically in patients that are have a chance for aerosolization or uh, are in drop of precaution, really serve a benefit. And we've moved to a two-tiered system, i.e., when patients are presumed to have, or we're in a room where somebody isn't very sick and needs to have some interventions done, we bring one of our two handheld systems in. Because they have a small footprint, they're easy to disinfect. And this tiered idea allows us to keep our cart-based systems in non-droplet, non-aerosolized areas. We also have, uh, this is also great for hospitalists and intensive care clinicians. And you can see these are some mock-up models. Uh, this is very nicely done describing the mechanism. We have a, use our regular sheaths that we use for central line placement. We slide the entire system inside, place some gel, and you have a nice portable system that you can carry into the room and also um, allow you to easily decontaminate. Some of the larger tablets, you may not need to cover the entire tablet, but then as you exit the room, I think the tablet needs to be cleaned with low-level disinfection completely the same way that you would the ultrasound probe. For procedural ultrasound, we have moved to um, the concept of what do we do with simple things such as central lines or, or even more simple things such as peripheral lines. And I think that for our peripheral lines, we're using transducer covers. Um, again, I know there's some controversy about this, but it is based on the fact that the pore size for most of these covers from tegaderms to other uh, covers are pretty small, anywhere from 27 to 30 nanometers. And you can see that I know there's some worry that acoustic lens damage can happen. We have not had experiences with that. We've not had problems with our transducers. And I think this is something you have to discuss with your ultrasound company. Um, again, the, the viral sizes are larger than the pore sizes. So we feel comfortable that these are good tools when we're doing peripheral lines. Again, Oliver pointed out that the needle is never close to the probe. For central venous cannulation, pericarditis et cetera, we are using full intact sterile sheath probe covers for these procedures. 
So again, I think standard low-level disinfection agents are virucidals to SARS-CoV-2. Um, when you think of your systems in the point-of-care environment, breaking into droplet aerosolized versus non-droplet aerosolized is a real nice way to separate your systems. Um, I think having some type of ability to get handheld systems is really a luxury today. If not, and you're still using CARP-based systems for all your patients, when you step out of a room with somebody who's coughing or is having an intubation, I think a complete wipe down with low level disinfection is standard. And I think this can really be also used in procedural ultrasound with just simple probe covers. Thank you. And off to Brian. Thank you. I'm Brian Bromley, and I'm honored to be here to talk about obstetrical ultrasound. Um, my point of view comes from two separate vantage points. I'm a partner in a private practice that specializes in OBGYN ultrasound at an outpatient uh, facility. And I'm also a maternal fetal medicine physician at the Massachusetts General Hospital. And I'm privileged to work with many people who are leaders in this area. Some of the information that I'm gonna share from you comes from our institutional protocols, but I wanna be clear that I'm not authorized to be a representative of the Mass General Hospital. And I'm also gonna share information with you that are derived from a variety of societal publications. And I'm stuck, let's see. And those are the societies that um, I'm gonna be talking about. Now, obstetrical ultrasound is a really critical part of pregnancy care. And the question is, how do you define what is essential? And that's not going to be a focus of this particular webinar. And I would refer you to a, a variety of statements put out by societies and institutions um, because it varies based on your clinical situation and the locale that you're practicing in. We all know, being imagers, that you can't do an ultrasound examination while being six feet apart from your patients. So we are always in close contact with our patients. And because of the pandemic situation, we have to really consider that all patients have a potential of being COVID-19 positive. Brian, make sure your mouse is on the presentation page. Uh, that I don't, here it is, yeah. There you go. So well, how do we go forward with our obstetrical ultrasound considerations? We need to manage patient expectations. We need to look at our workflow. I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about setting up and cleaning your ultrasound rooms. And we're gonna talk about strategies to prevent transmission of the COVID-19, including personal hand hygiene, uh, personal protective equipment, and ultrasound transducer cleaning, which has been covered. So we'll go over that pretty quickly. Now, how do we manage patient expectations in OB? Probably the biggest area is triage. So we save our routine outpatient ultrasound for individuals without respiratory symptoms or risk factors who are not considered persons under investigation or known to be COVID-19 positive. We separate those from those who are, have risk factors and those patients who are under investigation or have tested positive are managed remotely if that's clinically appropriate. So in terms of OB ultrasound, if at all possible, we want to delay the imaging by 14 days. And I put that in brackets because that was originally the interval decided upon based on viral incubation. However, the CDC has recently put out a different uh, updated protocol in patients who are COVID positive, and I'll leave you to look at your institutional protocols on that or the CDC, because it may be slightly different than the previously uh, designated 14 days. 
If you can't delay the ultrasound, then you're going to want to use a designated evaluation area for the ultrasound exam in accordance with your local guidelines. Now, the things that we do is we contact the patient by phone the day before her ultrasound study and ask her if she has any new respiratory symptoms or contact with a confirmed COVID positive person within the preceding 14 days. And the algorithm that you use to ask for those symptoms is available through a variety of societies and they all differ slightly. What we ask is, has the patient had a fever? Do they have new cough or shortness of breath? Do they have new nasal congestion or a runny nose? Do they have a new sore throat? Do their muscles ache? Or have they lost their sense of smell? And the outpatient ultrasound is reserved for those who answer negative to all the above questions. In some settings, like my private practice, we actually also take the patient's temperature upon checking in for the ultrasound and we let them know that we're going to do that. If you're going to ask those questions again, you have to have some kind of protocol in place if somebody screens positive. We require patients to wear a face mask. That's our institutional protocol. Um, we would like, if supply chain allows, to provide that mask to the patient, a surgical mask, and not have them wear the same face mask they've been wearing to the grocery store and in other places. It's important to recognize that some healthcare systems may not allow visitors. And in fact, many don't allow visitors during a prenatal ultrasound. And we have to tell our patients that before the appointment. And the whole idea is to prevent the asymptomatic spread of this virus and to protect both our healthcare providers as well as our patients and their babies. We also have changed our policies in that we allow patients to share a portion of the exam on a video conferencing app, um, but we really do not let this hamper our efficiency in performing the exam. It doesn't work very well if the patient wants to FaceTime the entire study. You really have to get in there, do your protocol, and get out. We also limit the number of souvenir uh, photos that we give the patient. Certainly getting a fetal profile is part of a routine scan and we get a lot of pictures of that. We document the extremities, we can give the patients pictures of that, but we don't take extra time to get 3D images and numerous photos for the patient. In addition, we explain to the patient that if there's a finding that takes time to explain, it'll likely be, for, be performed by telemedicine after the ultrasound examination. Now, our staff also has to be asymptomatic, and so where I work at the hospital, we all have to attest to not having any of the symptoms above, and then we get a little thing on our phone that says that we're cleared for work, and then we can show up in the lobby and the hospital will give us a surgical mask. In my private practice, we don't have that kind of an app, but we ask the same questions. We ask our staff to attest that they don't have any of these symptoms, and we actually take uh, our staff's uh, temperature both at the beginning and the end of their shift. Obviously, if you don't feel well at work, you need to tell your supervisor and leave. Some of our workflow considerations, we want to space ultrasound appointments so that you don't have very many patients in your waiting room. We like them to be at least six feet apart. Um, in both our private practice and sometimes in the hospital, patients prefer to wait in their cars until their ultrasound room is available. When they enter the facility, uh, we ask them to perform hand hygiene. We have sanitizer available to them. And if they haven't brought their own face mask, we give them a face mask, certainly at the hospital where there's an adequate supply. Uh, the hospital provides surgical face masks to all the patients. When we go through informed consent to do the ultrasound and to bill their insurance company, we obtain that verbally and we'll document, the sonographer will document that and we'll upload it into their record. But we don't pass paper back and forth anymore. 
you want to clean out your ultrasound room, so you want to minimize the clutter. You want to remove extra chairs. You know, we used to have the whole family come in, as those of you who do OB ultrasound remember. You don't need all those chairs. You especially don't want fabric chairs. Remove any bins, remove any chotki you might have. You want it to really be pristine. Another thing you want to do is minimize the number of transducers on your system, maybe one or two transducers that you use most commonly. Um, SMFM recommends a one to six or a two to nine and a two to nine, sorry. ISQUAG recommends a TA and TB probe. Really just choose two that you are most likely to use during that specific exam. 3D probes and other probes can be kept locked in cabinets or outside of the room. So the sonographer sonologist should do the following before and after each patient. We want to wash our hands with soap and water for at least 20 seconds or use hand sanitizer. We clean up our room with low-level disinfectant, and that includes the ultrasound transducers, the cords, the keyboards, including all the little nooks and crannies. Uh, gel bottles, if they're used, I work in two different systems. As I said, one uses the single uh, gel packet, which um, is optimal if you have them. It's a little bit of a pain to open each one, but that's probably the safest. If you use gel bottles, they definitely have to be uh, wiped down between uses. Wipe down the patient bed, rails if you had it, and any touch services. Think about light switches and doorknobs, and then those all have to be air dried. And we ask our sonographers to open and close the doors of the scan room so we don't have uh, further uh, exposure to any viruses. Now, your personal protective equipment for ultrasound will really depend on your supply chain and it'll vary by your institutional protocol. And you just have to know what your institutional protocol is. I'm sure they change like ours all the time. As sonologists and sonographers, we need to have proper instruction on how to put on and take off our PPE. They call that donning and doffing. We should all wear surgical masks. So both the patients and the sonographers should all be having surgical face masks. You should all be fitted for N95s or respirator masks if you work in a setting that's hospital-based where you may uh, scan a known positive COVID patient or a person under investigation. And we have just recently in our institution had an adequate uh, supply so that we can provide those for not only aerosolized generating procedures, but for anybody who is a known positive. It is recommended that you wear a face shield or eye protection that does vary among institutions, but as you saw from Oliver's presentation, people can get the virus from touching their eyes, touching their faces. You don't want to be touching your face like this little person all the time. Important to remember that regular glasses are not considered eye protection. Uh, we had a question before we did this webinar as to whether gloves were necessary. I think most of us use non-latex, non-sterile gloves for all procedures, uh, even doing an ultrasound. Even though the risk of contamination skin to skin is small, I think nobody wants to have gel on their hands. Um, you want to have sufficient supplies at the point of care. And ISWAG uh, recommends that you don't wear jewelry. Um, I suspect that's really rings and things that could hamper your hand hygiene. And they recommend that your arms are uncovered below the elbow. And I suspect that's so that you don't drag gel and other uh, things from room to room, since many of us don't have gowns when we're taking care of patients who are uh, not uh, showing signs of upper respiratory infection or exposure uh, to a COVID positive person. We talked about minimizing our ultrasound visits. Again, this is depending on the part of the country you live in, and I'm happy to send you our institutional protocol, but SMFM and ISWAG have excellent guidance in this regard. We wanna refine our imaging protocols to be efficient. Um, you might consider labeling only images as necessary. It may be worthwhile to document your study via video clips instead of individual images because it may be faster. Some people have suggested using biometry assist programs that allow you to measure quickly. 
Um, maybe you only need one measurement of the bipyridyl diameter instead of three or whatever your usual protocol is. You really want to be efficient. Um, we recommend 3D ultrasound for medical indications only and not for uh, mementos. And ultrasounds for reassurance are not appropriate. And by reassurance, I'm thinking of somebody who just wants to hear the heart or see the heartbeat or somebody who might have had a prior miscarriage but is otherwise doing well and so forth. We talked about probe cleaning and the thing that I would like to sort of underscore is that you really have to wipe off all the gel with a cloth. Now with your trans abdominal probes, we usually do that with the transducer still on the machine. We wipe off all the gel with a dry cloth and then we do low level disinfection with an antimicrobial germicide. You can see the CDC website or AIUM document that Oliver spearheaded, which will refer you to the appropriate germicides. Um, and then you wanna rinse if appropriate and air dry. If you can't get all the gel off, you really need to disconnect the transabdominal transducer from the ultrasound system and wash it with soap and water before you apply your low level disinfection. And the same applies with your transvaginal ultrasound. Another thing that you should think about is professional distancing. Look at your staffing needs. With decreased volume, because you're doing really only essential scans, you may not need as many providers in your unit at the same time. We try to minimize staff at a particular location. We're spacing out our review stations in our reading room. I don't know how your reading rooms are set up, but we have a very collegial relationship between the physicians and the sonographers. There can be 10 of us in a, in a re relatively small space reading all together. And so we've really tried to separate the review stations so we're not on top of each other. Utilize teleradiography, especially uh, this can be useful with at-risk providers who might be a little older or might have some medical conditions that can still participate in the workflow and read the scans remotely. Um, in the hospital, we may have somebody in the high-risk unit and another maternal fetal medicine physician or another physician reading from another portion of the hospital in their private office, again, to decrease the risk. If you have multiple sites, consider sort of uh, assigning staff to one side or the other. Rotate your staff to maintain a healthy team. And we're doing that both, well, we're doing that certainly in my private practice. People have days off and we separate so that we always have a healthy team to come on in. And in our institution, as well as my private practice, we are not having medical students or sonography students as trainees for this period of time. If you have a PUI, a person under investigation, or known to be COVID-19 positive, we recommend that if they are an inpatient, they are scanned in situ in the room that they're occupying. If they're an outpatient, we have a dedicated room with a bathroom close by and away from other OB patients. So in the hospital, the GYN clinic room is repurposed for this. So since we're not seeing routine GYN, there's a room that has a dedicated machine that uh, can be used to evaluate any uh, COVID positive patient or PUI where you were not able to delay the ultrasound evaluation um, because of the clinical circumstance. Obviously, the patients have to be uh, brought to the room in compliance with institutional protocols. We want to use an experienced sonographer. That doesn't necessarily mean an old sonographer or a doctor. It just means somebody who can really go in and get the most of the images most of the time. And it's great if you can have a, me a method of communication with that sonographer. For these patients, you really want to have uh, an N95 if available. Um, and that is, although it's not an aerosolizing producing uh, procedure, it still will protect the staff more than a surgical mask. You want to wear a face shield, you want to have gown, and you want to have gloves. As I mentioned, you really, if at all possible, want a dedicated ultrasound machine, a laptop or portable machine uh, if available. 
dedicated transducers, you don't need too many of them, one or two, single-use gel packs, and the same cleaning disinfection recommendations that we talked about previously. Now, I'm one of the people that has been kind of terrified about COVID. It's scary to go to work. You think, are you going to bring it home to your family? How likely are you going to die from it? Um, I have friends who've had it. I have had a friend in the ICU from it. But this is data that came from the Mass General Hospital on April 8th. Um, I, it is not granular on purpose, but these are results of individuals tested for COVID-19. And of those in Massachusetts who've been tested, 19% have been positive. Of the employees at Mass General Hospital who were tested, 10% are positive. And interestingly enough, clinical employees, those of us seeing patients, are positive less often than non-clinical employees. And there are a variety of reasons behind that, some of which are um, not as good as you might think. Um, but the importance of showing you this is that our PPE at some level is protecting us and our rate of positive testing is actually less than the general population that has been tested. And in the upper right hand, I'm just showing you our new Boston Hope Field Hospital, which is for COVID patients that is just going to be open today. What do we do about our at-risk health providers? Um, people who work with us, who are professors and revered uh, practitioners uh, in our work environment um, may have some of these uh, comorbidities and we would like to limit their exposure to patients if at all possible. Um, teleradiography is a good way to do that and there are other jobs within the system that they can partake in. What about our pregnant healthcare providers? Well, our currently available data does not indicate that pregnant women are at increased risk for COVID-19. However, they are known to be at increased risk from other respiratory infections, and ACOG says that they should be considered at some risk. ACOG also states that facilities may want to consider limiting exposure of pregnant healthcare providers to patients with confirmed or suspected COVID infection, especially during higher risk procedures like the aerosol generating procedures, if at all feasible based on staffing availability. And that was put out by ACOG at the end of February. It was last updated the middle of March. And this morning when I checked it, it's still written the same way on the ACOG website. There's an important study for those of you out in the field doing ultrasound on COVID positive patients or pregnant uh, with suspected coronavirus. And I would have you refer back to the priority study. It's what's gonna help us in the future know how uh, COVID and pregnancy interact. And lastly, I wanna thank you. Uh, we're all there working with you. And for those who can, you wanna be like that little piggy. Anyway, thank you very much. And I'm gonna pass this off now to nobody. Hold on. Would you like me to do it? Uh, you can do it. I think I just got it. It just went away. Hold on. We'll send it over to Dr. Barr. Perfect, here it comes. Great, uh, thank you. Um, I'm Richard Barr. I'm a private practice uh, radiologist in Northeastern Ohio. Um, I think our two speakers, um, um, Arun and Brian, have really gone over a lot of things. I want to mostly focus on kind of radiology things um, specifically. Everything that they said is useful um, and should be followed. So I'm just going to highlight things that are more um, concerning uh, for a radiology practice. So um, in general, radiologists do not perform lung ultrasounds, which are being used sometimes to evaluate these patients. But what I'm going to talk about would be considered if you're doing those patients uh, also. What we're usually called for is to do other examinations to evaluate other organs when uh, in these patients because they can have uh, other symptoms and other problems that need to be evaluated. Um, and I want to go over this, and things we really need to be concerned about are our patients, 
our receptionists and staff, sonographers, and radiologists. So always follow the CDC state and local recommendations because they can vary. Um, and it really depends on your location. So be aware that all the things that we're telling you today uh, are good ideas, but your state or uh, local government may want you to do things a little bit differently. And these things are changing relatively rapidly, so stay informed. Um, and for example, some states are now requiring all outpatient imaging centers to close which is not the case for us. Um, so I like to break this down into patient settings. So we have outpatient radiology, uh, we have low risk patients and what I'm gonna call high risk patients. And then for inpatients, again, we have low risk patients, high risk patients and ICU patients. So for the outpatient setting, what patients are appropriate? And again, this may vary by state. My understanding is some states have actually uh, closed outpatient imaging centers. Uh, for us, we are only allowed to do examinations that are urgent and no screening exams. So for us, patients that need an exam urgently include patients with acute abdominal pain, acute scrotal pain, symptomatic carotid artery uh, symptoms, uh, cancer patients that are actively being treated, uh, acute pain and swelling in the legs looking for DVT. So we are not allowed by the state to do screening exams. So we don't do any supplemental breast screening. We don't do any screening for abdominal aortic aneurysms. We don't do any screening for HCC in patients with chronic liver disease. And for the most part, we would not do any uh, thyroid studies. Um, if we have cancer patients that have been treated, uh, they're in a sense cured and they have no new symptoms, but are coming for their yearly follow-up, we ask those patients uh, to wait uh, until the situation is more appropriate for us to do them. Uh, another uh, big application we have is we do have um, referring doctors that call us and say, we need this examination. We need to make an, a decision on this patient today. So we are doing those patients and we rely on our referring doctors uh, to decide the urgency of those exams. Um, so again, in the outpatient setting, what do we do when uh, we don't know these patients? They're coming to us from referring doctors, so we often don't have any information on uh, them when they arrive. So we only allow one patient at the screening reception desk at a time. Uh, we take the patient's temperature, and if it's greater than 104 degrees Fahrenheit, we consider it abnormal. We also take the temperature of the staff on arriving and asking the symptoms, uh, and if it's abnormal, they get sent home. Um, the patient is asked the following questions. Have you traveled outside the country in the last 14 days? Have you been exposed to someone diagnosed with COVID-19 in the last 14 days? Has anyone around you been sick or sick in your family? Do you have a fever, cough, or difficulty breathing? And if the patient has an abnormal temperature or adds yes to any of these questions, they're flagged as what we're gonna call high-risk patients. If they're not, we flag them as low-risk patients. So we divide these patients as they come in into two groups. Any patient that has recently been diagnosed positive for COVID-19, we're asked to send them to the hospital. So any patient that we know has um, active COVID-19, we do not uh, do them in our imaging center. So if the patient is low risk, they're given a face mask. Um, we have several uh, employees that like to sew. So they've made a whole bunch of masks uh, for these low risk patients. Um, then they're asked to sit in the waiting room at least six feet away from anyone else. Um, and if possible, they're really taken directly to registration. And then the patient uh, is escorted from registration uh, either to the, uh, excuse me, back to a low risk dressing room if needed and uh, then do a low risk ultrasound suite. If the patient is high risk, um, they are escorted directly to a high risk changing room um, and change into PPE, which includes a surgical mask. We're using disposable gowns because we normally have cloth gowns and we use a disposable gown so they can just be um, uh, thrown away uh, appropriately uh, after the patient is, instead of going into our uh, pile of uh, gowns that go to be cleaned, um, and where they're actually given gloves. And then they're escorted directly back to the high-risk ultrasound room 
uh, by a sonographer who's in complete PPE, including an N95 mask, an eye shield, cap gown, foot covers, and gloves. And then after the exam, the patient is brought back to the high-risk dressing room directly and changed into their street clothes um, and leave directly. Uh, we've kind of did this so they have the shortest amount of distance uh, that they have to walk within our imaging center. And then obviously this high-risk changing room equipment, ultrasound room, uh, are then cleaned with germicide wipes immediately after uh, the patient is complete. And we'll talk about a little bit more of that as we go along. Other uh, front area issues, uh, we clean all of our seats uh, with germicidal wipes um, after a patient uh, sits in them. Uh, the whole room is, uh, rating room is re uh, cleaned um, every day after uh, done, but again, after each patient sits in a chair, we clean that area. Uh, we do not allow any visitors into the center, and we have hand washing and hand sanitizer are available at that reception desk that we screen the patient and ask the patient to either wash their hands or use hand sanitizer uh, when they arrive. Uh, other issues, surgical masks and N95 masks and gloves need to be put on and taken off in a specific manner to limit contamination. And I think those um, sonographers that work maybe in a high risk uh, or you know, a, a large hospital may be trained to do this, but I suspect that most sonographers that are working mostly in outpatient imaging centers have not been trained. So I think it's really important that you learn how to use this, um, the gloves, how to take them on and off, how to uh, adjust the mask so that they're on properly. Um, and I've included here one website uh, that shows you on how to do this. And I think, again, particularly in those sonographers that are just doing an outpatients, this may be something foreign to them. Um, and they really need to be trained to make sure they're using the PPE appropriately, because if they're not, they're risking uh, possible uh, contamination. So again, in our outpatient setting for the low risk patient, we have our sonographer wear a face mask, a surgical mask or N95 mask. Uh, we do have uh, sufficient N95 mask, so we leave it up to the sonographer um, if they wanted to use an N95 or a surgical mask, they're given gloves and eye protection. Um, I think it's really important too to note that eyeglasses are not appropriate eye protection. So there are glasses that are made for appropriate eye protection. Uh, those should be used or some other um, covering uh, of the eyes, either a shield or we have um, some surgical masks that have a built-in plastic um, eye cover. Um, gowns are optional, um, and then they wash their hands before and after each patient. Uh, we do have a sink in every of one of our ultrasound rooms, um, and we also have sanitizer um, if they want to use it. For the high-risk patients, uh, and I will mention, um, uh, Brian said that about 20% of their screening patients are positive. In Northeastern Ohio, that is actually much lower. It's probably on the order of 5% uh, of those patients that we screen that we consider high risk. Um, so, but again, we have to realize that every patient that walks in is a potential uh, patient that has COVID uh, or has COVID-19. So all these precautions should be uh, done and, and we should always assume that the patient is infected. But for the high risk, again, the patient, the sonographer wears a complete PPE, including an N95 mask, gloves, face shield, bonnet, shoes, covers, and gowns. Um, and they wash their hands again before and after each patient. And again, they have option of using um, sanitizer, which we have um, in every room. Um, in the outpatient uh, setting for the radiologist, we each have our own reading room that's quite large. So we really are, uh, more than six feet away from each other. I think Bronwyn gave you um, a nice um, just instructions if you have a reading room that uh, you may not be able to be six feet away. Um, but we, the reading room is wiped down with germicide at the start of the day. Uh, the microphone is wiped with germicidal wipes before and after each radiologist. The reading room is wiped uh, at the end of the day or between radiologists. Um, we wash hands and sanitizer on entering and leaving the reading room. If the radiologist does go to a scanning room, they wear the same PPE as we have recommended 
uh, for the sonographer. And again, we wash hands and sanitize on entering the ultrasound room and leaving. Um, if the radiologist does not act with others in the reading room, does not need to wear a facial mask. Obviously, outside the reading room, they do wear a surgical mask. For our uh, situation, most of the communication with the sonographers can be done by phone. So we don't have sonographers necessarily coming into the reading room. Um, so again, another reason why uh, we don't necessarily wear uh, the face masks. Um, in the inpatient setting, and I think uh, that Arun and Brian went over a lot of the information. So I'm just gonna again, highlight things. And obviously your hospital should have procedures in place to keep patients safe, similar to our low risk uh, patient. Ideally, it would be nice to have, your, have a system where you're segregating people at higher risk and lower risk uh, so that uh, they are kept separate. Um, and again, we use the same recommendations for our outpatient setting. Um, and again, I think it's key that I think both of the previous speakers have said it, it's ideal if you have enough equipment that you have equipment that's set aside for high risk or positive patients, as well as other equipment that's set aside for low risk patients. In the high risk patient, those patients that you're going uh, either uh, in the department, on the floor, um, again, same recommendations that we recommend for a high risk outpatient setting. If the exam is portable, and we recommend that if you do have that, try to use one of the smaller systems, and it's been discussed with the other two authors, if you can have those smaller systems that are easier to clean, it makes a, a big difference. Um, again, uh, don't uh, you need to clean the machine uh, before you return to the department. Um, if you need to set up in scrubs, use whatever recommendation uh, that is being used at your hospital. Um, and I think a couple of the other authors have said, again, remove all non-essential equipment, transducers, everything you have on the machine needs to be cleaned. So the less stuff you have, the less you're going to have to do in cleaning and the less likely are you're going to leave some contamination. Um, again, using a small handheld or laptop system that you can uh, cover with the plastic covers will aid in cleaning, um, and each hospital may have additional recommendations. For ICU patients, I think Arun went over uh, a lot of the things we uh, you need to do. Again, we need to have a little bit higher uh, attention to cleaning the machine, entire machine, the transducer, the cord of the transducer. Again, ideally, if you have one of these small handheld or laptop systems that can completely be covered with plastic, um, that is going to aid in cleaning. You still need to use your low-level disinfectant, even if you use the plastic cover. Remember that the virus does live longer on plastic, so you need to be very careful on disposing of those plastic covers. Um, and again, you should follow uh, the recommendations uh, for PPE in your uh, center. And again, ideally, it would be nice to have separate machines um, that are for these uh, patients uh, as opposed to bringing it back down to the department. Um, we went over transducer cleaning a lot, but I just want to highlight that all cracks and crevices need to be cleaned as well as the cable if it's touched the patient. Um, if you cannot remove the gel with paper towel or cloth, you need to take the probe off and you need to go and wash it with soap and water um, and then use the low level disinfectant. If you need a sterile probe cover and do not have one, you can use a sterile glove. And I mention this because my friends in Europe um, who are really short on equipment um, are using these kind of things uh, to deal with these situations. If you don't need to have a sterile probe cover, you can use a plastic bag or you can use plastic wrap um, again, remember to clean the uh, table. Um, obviously, if we, for us with the high risk patients, as well as the interventional patients, we use a trophon uh, or some other high level disinfectant. Um, the AIM guidelines say for those high risk patients, low level disinfectant uh, is also appropriate. Um, I think we're just taking a little bit extra concern uh, on those patients to make sure they sterilize just in case we don't get all the gel off. Uh, we think using that high level disinfectant will help. 
The ultrasound machine, again, if you have a machine that is easy to clean and doesn't have a lot of knobs or keyboard, it's a little bit easier. Uh, unfortunately, I think most radiology departments have machines with keyboards and knobs and crevices that can get things in. Um, again, when I think Arun went over this, you have two hands. Use one hand to touch the patient and do the exam, one hand to touch the machine and try not to cross contaminate. Um, again, you need to clean the machine with the uh, germicidal wipe after each COVID-19 positive patient and well as several times during the day if you have uh, high-risk patients or even low-risk patients. Um, if you are really concerned, um, on the image on the right, I just took plastic wrap and wrapped up the machine. Uh, this is another way, particularly if you've got patients that may have aerosols or coughing, uh, it doesn't completely eliminate the possibility of the machine getting COVID. Again, be very careful when you take the plastic off, do it in a way that you're disposing of it because again, uh, the virus can live quite long on uh, the plastic. And even though you use plastic, you still need to clean the machine with low level disinfectant. But I think using the plastic helps to make sure things don't fall in the cracks and crevices. Um, and again, as we've mentioned several times, try to use uh, patient, uh, machines that are for high risk and low risk. Um, obviously, the ultrasound room should be clean and sanitized, particularly after each high risk patient, including the bed, the doorknob, um, the light switch, as Bri uh, Brian meant, um, Bronwyn mentioned, um, and anything the patient touches or possible aerosol contamination needs to be cleaned. Um, keep the room with the least amount of clutter. Um, and uh, if for low risk rooms, uh, the machine in the table, and again, anything the patient touches should be cleaned with low level disinfectant as well as cleaning room periodically. Um, so to summarize, know the risk of the patient. Uh, it will help you. You have to keep the appropriate PPE uh, for those high-risk patients. You really need to make sure you're using the appropriate PPE. And again, I think a lot of sonographers that are working in outpatient settings do not know how to appropriately put on, take off, or adjust this equipment. It's very important. There are many uh, websites that allow you to do this and looking at uh, some videos, uh, that's very important because if you don't appropriately uh, use the PPE, uh, you are at risk for getting contaminated. And again, what we have done is we've kind of uh, put patients into two groups, low and high risk, but remember, even the low risk patients have a risk of having the virus. And again, we're limiting our examinations to those that are really necessary, uh, no screening examinations, uh, and uh, unfortunately, we all don't have uh, a center like this on the right that has a huge plastic screen with a small hole to put your arm through so you have no contact with the patient at all, um, and hopefully we won't uh, come to that. Um, so with that, uh, I'm going to end my talk. Um, I hope that uh, the three of us uh, giving you clinical information and Oliver doing a really good uh, discussion on how to clean things and what's appropriate uh, for the AAM guidelines is going to help you in your center. Um, again, you're allowed to ask uh, questions. Please uh, send them in. We'll answer them and get them on the AIUM website uh, within a short period of time. And again, uh, thank you for attending this webinar.